one and they have to unmute themselves. Okay. Hi, everybody. We want to welcome you to our first monthly educational call. And um, this is brought to you by Halen House. And Halen House is a nonprofit whose mission is healing the root cause and effects of trauma and it creates health, resilience, and wholeness. And this month, we are going to focus on nutrition. And we have four special guests. And these ladies are functional nutritional therapists. And what we're going to have them do is introduce themselves, give a little bit about their background, and um, how they got into this uh, line of work. Um, but before we get into that, um, I wanted Cheryl to kind of go over uh, some instructions for you and how this is going to work. So I'll send it over to Cheryl. Hi. So for um, everyone on the call, if you are not talking, please uh, make sure that your microphone is muted. Uh, when you have a question, please use the chat box. And if it's pertinent to whatever the presenter is talking about, we'll bring that question in right away. Otherwise, we'll hold it until the end. And if you're interested in having the handouts from this presentation, send an email to halenhouse at gmail.com. I also wanted to point out that um, the, all the ladies, their uh, bios, as well as the links to their website are on the uh, meetups, as well as the Facebook pages. So if you want to get more information about um, any of these ladies, the information is posted there. So, um, and I should have pointed out, um, Hale, Hale and House, um, Cheryl is my co-founder, and then Maria Cookson, she is our lovely assistant, secretary, treasurer, extraordinaire. So um, we are the three people that make up Halen House. And, and ladies, we wanna thank you so much for joining us and being our first educational uh, series. So I am now gonna turn this over to Kathy Eason. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Eason. It's nice to see you all here today. And I want to first just say thank you to Cheryl and Suzanne and Maria and my great colleagues, Anne and Sandy and Deanna. Um, for, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for bringing what we feel is a cornerstone of health, nutrition, to the table talking about trauma. These are certainly traumatic times, and um, those of you who have experienced trauma in your life, big or small, will really benefit from some of the information we hope to share today. A little bit about myself. Um, I am Kathy Eason, and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I am a functional nutritional therapy practitioner, as Suzanne pointed out. And then I'm one of those people that's been doing this a long time, so I just keep studying and learning. I'm a certified autoimmune paleo specialist. I am a certified food and spirit practitioner. I'm a functional diagnostic nutritionist. And there's a couple more that don't really matter. What it really means is that I understand the value of whole food nutrition and what it does for our health and not just our physical health, but our mental, emotional, spiritual health. It's been sort of my mission for the last 25 years of my career to keep learning and augmenting. How I got into nutrition was really through a body worker's perspective. I used to be a physical therapy assistant. I'm currently still a licensed massage therapist in the state of Oregon. And working on the physical body and a lot of people who experienced traumatic events that led them to lose their physicality really taught me a lot about, we can't just work on the inflammation from the outside of our body. We need to work on it from the inside of our body. And I shudder to think about some of the uh, nutrition information that I was misguided about, about 25 years ago when I first got into this. But it led me on a path of study. And really, um, nutrition has turned into this hot topic that's overly complicated, but it doesn't have to be. It's really about whole foods, real foods, well-prepared foods, and making great choices that taste delicious to fuel us and help us feel vibrant. Now, the other nutritionists and I here today, we're gonna to talk to you a lot about some of the specialties we do and how we dive into when things get a little bit beyond that. A whole food diet is the cornerstone, 
but we have lots of tips, tools, tricks that we can share with you to sort of um, boost your health to the next level. Uh, I work in a couple of ways. Uh, this has been a unique time for all of us. And in the pandemic, I've gone to mostly uh, telehealth and, and tele appointments. And I work mostly online, which is really hard for me. I'm a clinician. I'm a body worker. I'm used to getting my hands on people. I do some things called visceral manipulation. So if you have organs that are stuck, I am licensed to kind of move and put them back into place and that can help your health. At the same time, you're helping your health with nutrition. I work through a company called Open Door Healing that I founded a couple years ago, and it's really just an extension of myself. And then I'm currently working on another company, neilmialo.com, and you'll have all the links to these. And we are working on brain-based plant and mineral essential oils that, in my opinion, have been game changers um, as a really simple tool to healing. And when I start my little presentation a little bit, I'm going to um, share with you an exercise that I hope you'll take with you. You don't need anything other than yourself and your breath to do it. The rest of my history is that I just spent the last 15 years teaching nutritional therapy practitioners for the Nutritional Therapy Association. And it was time for me to move on and do a little bit more. So now I'm sort of um, spreading my wings in this time of great uncertainty. And it's scary and terrifying and fun all at the same time. And I really couldn't be more excited to be on this panel today with friends and colleagues. Some were former students, but now they're just my you know, treasured uh, helpers of humanity. So with that said, let me introduce our next guest from Brainworks of Oregon, Ann Morrison and Sandy Wesson. Girls, ladies, thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Sandy Wesson, and I am a registered nurse, have been so for 40 years, with many years working in the critical care units, seeing all sorts of emotional and physical traumas. Um, and I also worked in hospice, so I saw both ends of things. I saw a lot of people who I've, I felt like didn't have to be hospice patients as early in life as they were. And that was something that really affected me and frustrated me. Um, many years into my clinical nursing practice, I um, realized the importance of nutrition and other, I mean, I knew that all along, but really wanted to study it more. So I went back to school and became a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. It's a mouthful, but really just learning um, every step of digestion and how foods affect our bodies and when digestion isn't working, how it affects our health. So um, that and then going on and, and really studying in depth about detoxification. Um, we found um, at Brainworks of Oregon, and we'll introduce yourself in a moment, but you know, Ann and I, as we were working with clients, found that we could get a long way with people in working with nutrition and, and having their body sort of gently detox them itself, but some people were stuck and we realized we had to go further into detoxification. And we'll talk a little bit about that later and the benefits of that. Um, and then working with nutrition, or excuse me, with neurofeedback, um, that was the next piece that we recognized the importance of brain health. And sometimes regardless of everything else we do, it's hard to unstick the brain. And I know later Anne will be talking more about that. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about neurofeedback and how it affects us in times of both emotional and physical trauma. Um, how did I come to this? You know, I always, when I was young, I always knew that I wanted to help people. And I think that just led me to nursing naturally. But really moving into nutrition, I recognized even with all of my years, with all of my knowledge, with all of my extended study as a nurse and that ongoing education, that I still had a lot of my own physical issues that wasn't being helped by Western medicine. As a child, I had eczema head to toe. You know, as an adult, I had digestion issues. I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had brain fog. I'd had concussions. I'd been in auto accidents. And I had lived in a um, water damaged building. So I developed mold related illnesses and that was extremely devastating. Um, and then also finding out that I was dealing with parasites and what that did to my health. So 
as a result of that, um, Anne and I have both done a lot of study in detoxification, including parasites. And again, I'll touch on that a little bit later, but understanding what mold and all of that does to our health and how hard it is to get well, our emotional health, as well as our physical health. So it has just really um, been exciting for me to recognize that along with my background in Western medicine and helping patients in that way and understanding how the medications affect the body, but also now taking it to a much broader level and really digging for the root cause of issues so that we don't have to reach the point of ending up on hospice early in life as opposed to later in life as a natural course of, of, of life. So um, I'll let Anne introduce herself and talk a little bit more. That I'm so glad to be here today. Um, my name is Ann Morrison, um, and thank you to our hosts. Um, really appreciate getting the word out on this really important topic. Um, been a registered nurse for over 35 years. Um, part of my experiences as a community health nurse and actually working, going into people's homes, I, I know what people have in their refrigerator. Um, I know what their thoughts are on food. And I know how the medical community uh, that is overseeing a lot of, of people with ill health, how they teach about nutrition or don't teach about nutrition. So this, I always knew there was something missing. And, um, you know, I uh, will talk later about the ACE study, um, which my experience personally with the ACE study, it's the Adverse Childhood Effects Study, um, has a powerful influence on people. Recognizing trauma um, is a big piece of it. Trauma can come in all ways. Um, so I'll talk more about that later. Um, so these things, I knew I had increased good fats in my diet and my digestion was on track. So I wasn't gonna have that knee replacement I was so close to having. And that my family history said that I would have, but I was there was still something. And for me, what happened, I still needed that PTSD training for neurofeedback. And I'll talk more about that later. So that's kind of what has led me personally in this journey to where we are today and doing what we're doing. And I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much. Great, thank you both. Um, Deanna DeWitt, do you want to say hello and tell us about you and Elevated Wellness and Yoga? I would love to. Thank you, ladies. It's a pleasure to be a part of this today. Um, so yeah, my name is Deanna DeWitt. I am a functional nutritional therapy practitioner as well. Um, I'm also a wellness educator. Education is a big part of my platform and what I do. Um, and with that, I'm a sugar detox coach. So I lead people through five-week sugar detox programs. And I'm also a yoga instructor. So just bringing in that incorporation of movement and body awareness into my practice. Um, and uh, my practice is called Elevated wellness. So within my practice, I work a lot with um, clients who are just looking to kind of reset. So whether that's coming from trauma or um, just a lifestyle of nutritional imbalances or just looking for an outlet to feel better. A lot of what I do in my practice is also meal planning. So I do work with people as far as kind of getting in really healthy whole foods into their uh, kitchen into their lifestyle into their family through meal planning and uh, one of the areas that I've specialized my practice in is in neuronutrition um, and being certified as a neuronutritionist or um, certified in amino acid therapy and we'll get the opportunity to talk about that a little bit later um, but it's really there to help support people as kind of a bridge therapy um, people who may be battling mental health challenges um, and those can show up in all kinds of ways and we know those often times go hand in hand with um, trauma and also with having uh, nutritional imbalances. So that's kind of what I do. What really got me into this work is my own personal path. About a, a decade ago now, um, my mid-20s, I was living a very different lifestyle, um, very fast-paced, um, very fast-paced career. I was experiencing a lot of anxiety and digestive issues, um, some mental health challenges. Um, and then I was also experiencing some 
some heart challenges at the time. So being in my mid twenties, I was scared out of my mind um, and spent about a year traveling around to various doctors and, and trying to um, go the conventional route and get some solutions that way. And I really felt that in my experience, a lot of the solutions were more of a band-aid approach. So um, whether that was suggesting to take an anxiety medication or um, pharmaceuticals to kind of slow my heart rate down. And although there's absolutely a time and place for that, um, for me, it just didn't sit right. It didn't feel right. Um, and I came across this really amazing Indian doctor who became my cardiologist. And he was the first person who kind of introduced the concept of um, you know, well, tell me about what you're eating. Tell me about your lifestyle. Tell me about your relationships and your career. And I was like, wow, you are the first doctor in about a year and a half that's asked me those questions. And so I felt really lucky to have that connection and really open the door for me that, um, you know, I can actually uh, control my health. And, and so it led me down this rabbit hole of nutrition and mindfulness and introduced me to yoga. And um, I always say that yoga kind of saved my life at that point. Um, and put me on a very different trajectory and, and was able to really overcome a lot of my health challenges through food and nutrition and mindfulness and yoga. And it just led me down this route where I was so passionate about, experience, um, about exploring this with other people and sharing these kind of tips and techniques. And um, so, yeah, at that point, I decided to kind of say goodbye to my career there in, in Los Angeles at the time and move home and go back to school and do this. And um, I have a pretty ex extensive family history of mental health challenges and um, diabetes. So those two things were really important for me to feel like I could give back, like it could empower people with um, the education or the nutrition support to kind of overcome those challenges. So that's what I do. Thank you, Deanna. Um, as everybody was talking, even though I know you all, I was reminded how much we all have in common and where our like, like people attract like people, correct? And, you know, we, I think um, on the scale of zero to a thousand, there's a place for everybody on that trauma scale, right? Um, big and small. Um, Sandy, I also grew up in a water damaged building and suffered with health challenges from mold toxicity and the anxiety that can develop around that. And, um, you know, some of the depressive tendencies that can develop around that when you don't understand that there's somebody else in your body, fungus in that case, really kind of controlling your emotions for you. And Deanna, I also, as you know, um, I have a lot of family history of diabetes and then the mental and emotional health disorders that um, derive with it. And um, as you're also talking and thinking about how, more about how I got into this, people in my family all look at me like I'm this health nut. And I realized that the story I forgot to tell was when I was about six years old, I stole the bottle of Flintstones chewable vitamins out of the cupboard and I went and laid down in front of Saturday morning cartoons under a blanket and I ate the entire bottle of vitamins. I got really sick, but I think it might have led me on this nutrition path before I, <laughs> I kind of hyper neutralized myself and, and got there. But so thank you for sharing um, that what I wanted to do next was if somebody could make sure I can share the screen. So if somebody wants to make me the host, Cheryl, I think that's you. Then I can, um, thank you. I'm going to share. Oops. One more time. There it is. Okay. Um, we just, um, the four of us together, see if I can make this a little bigger. Um, the four of us together sort of came up with just a handful of questions that are common to us as nutritional therapy practitioners and especially thinking about how it relates to mental, emotional health and trauma. And again, this is a huge spectrum, whether you were, um, you know, somebody who perhaps was a victim of a very significant trauma or it's little pieces of trauma that build up over time. There are definite physical, chemical agents at play in your body at all times that help you manage that. So what we thought we would do next, and maybe if my colleagues could also make sure you're unmuted and 
um, help me talk about this is we wanted to talk about some of these common questions. And I think the most common question we get when people are coming to us and expressing mental, emotional health patterns that we see as dysfunctional and that they're starting to impact life um, is what does my diet have to do with any of this? How does my diet impact my emotional state? And why is it that some foods in particular seem to trigger my trauma and my traumatic reactions, whether it's anxiety, depression, uh, lack of sleep, insomnia, something we all commonly see. So um, Deanna, being the, the neuronutrition specialist on the panel here, do you wanna take a stab at answering some of this or should you wanna start the conversation for us? Absolutely, and I think just to start that conversation, just a little background on what is kind of neuronutrition, what is amino acid therapy, and it all starts with what are neurotransmitters. And our brain really transmits kind of our feelings through these highly specialized what I call mood molecules um, known as neurotransmitters. And some of you may be familiar with them. Uh, for example, serotonin. Serotonin is pretty common. It's majority, majority of it's made in your gut. It is a neurotransmitter that helps with our kind of happy feelings, our mood, um, well-being, memory, sleep, even pain sensitivity. Um, and our new neurotransmitters or these mood molecules are actually made up of specialized proteins. And these proteins are called amino acids acids. And amino acid therapy is really just the use of uh, targeted amino acids to help balance that, those neurotransmitters in the brain and the body. Um, and they can really help with your mood, your energy, your memory, again, your pain sensitation, uh, sensitivity, I should say, sensations, um, your sleep, and either, even other kind of physical sensations in the body. And the reason I really use this in my practice is not to replace some of that deeper work, which is nutritional therapy, really getting in that foundation of a healthy diet and hydration and proper sleep and stress management, um, but is as a bridge therapy or a kind of therapeutic alternative to psychopharmaceuticals or for people who are looking for maybe a more safer or, or alternative route um, to using pharmaceuticals. It was... Um, amino acid therapy was used heavily up until about the mid 80s when Prozac really came into the market um, and has been kept alive today. Julie, Ro Julie Ross is one of the um, kind of founders or one of the um, pioneers who's really kept it alive. And again, it's really not meant to kind of replace that deeper work, but when paired with the foundational work, so a proper um, whole foods diet and the proper hydration, it can really help people get to that level where they're able to make some of those bigger changes. Um, and nutritional, uh, I'm sorry, neurotransmitter deficiencies, they can really show up for a lot of various reasons. One of the biggest ones though is trauma and whether that's small kind of micro traumas throughout your life or um, trauma as a childhood or one really big traumatic event, um, they can really deplete our neurotransmitters. And so having that amino acid support to help bring them back into balance can be really helpful um, and often can be overlooked. Another area that we find deficiencies in neurotransmitters is with a poor diet. So poor diet, um, excessive use of uh, alcohol or recreational drugs, um, really having any protein imbalances as neurotransmitters are made out of amino acids, which I had mentioned are specialized proteins. Um, and then, you know, another one is genetics, kind of what you're showing up with here. So um, there's a lot of kind of empowerment that can happen with this bridge therapy, but um, I love introducing it to people because it's something that we can trial in the moment and people know right away if it's something that can support them. Um, and then it gives us clues as to where we might need to focus their nutritional therapy um, and their help with. And a lot of this stuff is um, this, these amino acids you can you know, purchase from your local health food store. So um, I always recommend working with a um, certified practitioner or a nutritional therapist in this area, of course, but uh, that's a little bit about neurotransmitters, amino acid therapy. Hopefully that kind of answers your question, Kathy, or starts us off with that. Yeah, I want to pick up on two things you said that the four of us here all share, um, you know, that the majority of your neurotransmitters like serotonin are produced in the gut. And let's just define what the gut is, because all of us here are, are gut brain practitioners. I've also 
started calling myself a brain gut practitioner because I've been working from a different aspect. But um, for the people on the session today, that's something really important to understand is that the reason we're so dedicated to a whole food diet is because that's what helps maintain the integrity of your tissues, of your gastrointestinal system, your digestive system. And not only the integrity of the tissues, but the ability to break down those dietary proteins into the specialized pieces of proteins, those amino acids that Deanna was talking about that make up your neurotransmitters. And so when we say the majority of the neurotransmitters come from your gut, it's true. It's about 70% of the serotonin that your body needs to maintain a level mood, to help you fall asleep at night, and also to trigger other neurotransmitters is produced in the tissues that are known as neuroendocrine cells in the intestinal tract. And so I, um, over the years, have studied a lot about uh, gut and brain issues. I'm a certified um, gut and psychology syndrome practitioner. If anybody out there is familiar with the GAPS diet, um, authored by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, one of my mentors. She's a medical doctor and a PhD neuroscientist and one of the smartest people on the planet when it comes to putting whole foods in the body and, and having it do its thing. And I know that Anne and Sandy, you also um, really focus on gut health in your practice. And what does that mean to you to help somebody focus on gut health related to that first question? What is my diet? How does my diet impact my emotional state? What do you think? The, the gut is, <clears throat> and, and what we eat is such an, and does have such a, a huge impact. Because things like if we have food allergies, then those, <clears throat> pardon me, food allergies alone, when we're eating foods that we're reacting to, we're causing more inflammation in our gut. And we cause, some, we cause something like leaky gut, meaning there's small pinholes in the lining of the intestinal tract and the intestinal tract is only one to two cells thick, which is really thin. So it doesn't take much for these large proteins that we talked about and different toxins to, to poke holes in the gut and then allow toxins and proteins into the bloodstream. And then not only is there inflammation in the gut, but then there's inflammation in the brain. And so that inflammation in the brain can cause more brain fog and memory issues and just so many things, as well as taking that inflammation to other organs, you know, or our joints. So what we eat has a huge impact. Um, and if we've got leaky gut, then we're not even absorbing the nutrients that we are. Not only are we not breaking them down properly, but we're not absorbing them. So if we can't get the nutrients inside the body, inside the cells, that's an effect it's known that if we're deficient in B vitamins, then there's a higher incidence of anxiety and depression. If we don't have enough of the good fats, you know, then there's anxiety and depression. I'm sure Anne has other things to add to that as well. Well, we know that if there's inflammation in the gut, there's inflammation in the brain. Um, and we'll be getting into that more, more later uh, via the vagus nerve, sending little messenger, inflammatory messengers so, um, and vice versa, inflammation in the brain from injury, you will soon have inflammation in your gut. Yeah. I think that's really important to point out, especially kind of back to what Deanna was talking about, about neuronutrients, you know, these specialized targeted amino acids that can help very specifically. They really do need to be um, sort of guided by the hands of a practitioner like Deanna or the rest of us here, because um, more is not always better. Right. And sometimes choosing the right nutrient um, is very important. When Ann just said um, the inflammation in the gut is equivalent to inflammation in the brain, what she's referring to is that the blood-brain barrier tissues, the mucosal tissues are, and the endothelial tissues there are actually the same cell origin as the gut. Uh, so just think of it as one big long gastrointestinal tube, it's the same tissue. And when Sandy was talking about how our, the gut lining can get perforated and leaky and, and lead things through, the same thing can happen to your blood-brain barrier. Right. And in my experience with people trying to sort of um, self-medicate with nutrition, uh, you know, their, their intentions are in the good place, but you can do a little bit of um, exacerbation of your symptoms, maybe increased anxiety, maybe increased depression, uh, increased uh, traumatic recall 
can happen when we are trying to force nutrients across a blood brain barrier that is not intact, that is not selective to what it needs. And so this is really the big, big picture of what brain gut or gut brain health means to me is that we need to get the integrity of those tissues back. We do it uh, nutritionally with diet first and foremost, if we can, um, while working with a qualified uh, practitioner to get specific targeted nutrition to both speed that healing process, but also to rebalance some of those nutrients necessary for neurotransmitter health. So thank you all for bringing up like those super important pieces there. If I had to ask you, what do you think is your one best food or daily dietary impact for gut health? What would you say, each of you? On the count of three. <laughs> Bone broth. <laughs> you know, so, I, yeah. actually, I actually have to say, you know, from somebody who had some histamine issues, bone broth cannot always be the answer. But no, I same here. If you heal those issues, then I believe bone broth can be such an amazing, yeah. amazing support for the for the gut. Um, right. I highlighted the this. Bladder. Yeah, I highlighted this here. Soups, stocks, and broths. You know, yeah. this is a great time of year. We're going into the fall season. Temperatures are going to get a lot colder in Central Oregon, especially this coming weekend. This right. is a great time of year to make take advantage of the seasonal foods and learn a little bit more about um, vegetable stocks, meat stocks, bone broths, and make some really good soups. And I'm just going to give you... Um, we have so many tips we could give you, but I'm gonna give you one little trick that's really easy to implement in your kitchen right now. And that's that we're gonna tell you in this panel here that we all want you to eat more vegetables. There's lots of reasons to eat more vegetables. They're full of fiber, they're full of nutrition, vitamins, minerals, they have um, prebiotic fibers that get fermented and help feed the good beneficial bacteria in your gut. It's a huge part of brain health. And so one really simple thing to do is as you're learning more about preparing vegetables, and it can be really easy. Vegetables can be chopped and eaten raw, really well chewed, by the way. They can be put into a stew, but a lot of us are used to peeling our vegetables. And if you are somebody who's not yet um, able to find affordable organic vegetables, then we would recommend that you take the peels off of conventionally raised um, vegetables. That's where you're going to get a little bit more exposure to potentially toxic chemicals like pesticides. So, but if you're, if you've got a local source of vegetables, whether they're certified organic or not, if you're buying the best quality vegetables you can, every time you peel your vegetables, don't just throw them in the compost or in the garbage, save the peels, put them in a bag or in a container in your freezer, and when you have a big, you know, say maybe like quart, quart and a half um, compilation of onion skins and carrot peels and beet peels and um, all the peels you have, take those out, put those in a pot with a couple quarts of water, add a nice big pinch of sea salt and make yourself a vegetable stock. You'll strain it and then drink it. And now you're going to get a really nutrient dense vitamin and mineral rich broth that is going to start to set the stage for getting some of those important minerals and amino acids in uh, to your diet um, in a really affordable way. Um, I think this is this Absolutely. time period is teaching us, uh, we're all having to cook a little bit more, right? We've been at home, we've been sort of forced back into the kitchen, which for me has been glorious, right? Because I love to cook. Um, and I was in the habit of, you know, going out a little too much, just like a lot of us were in our hectic lifestyle. So this time is teaching us some economy, and I think it's really good, but at the same time, it's teaching us economy. It's getting us to get our hands on food again, and I think a lot of us on this panel today would say that being involved in your food preparation is one of the keys to healing. You really have Absolutely. to make your choices of what you're purchasing, um, put your hands on your vegetables, washing them you know, chopping your meats, all the things that we do in the kitchen is going to make you more connected to your food. And it's going to make the assimilation of the nutrients within that food more effective for you. Well, I have to chime in here for someone who doesn't like to cook. Um, it, I think you ladies said that there might be a link that you can um, share some easy recipes. I think Deanna, it was you yeah. that you've got some really great easy yeah. recipes people can do at home. 
um, maybe, in, you know, include their kids in on it or something like that. So I promised our, you know, our people watching and listening that we'd, we would give them some easy things. And I love that uh, vegetable broth idea, Kathy, that was amazing. Um, so yeah, we, I'd love to include some sort of links um, for some other easy recipes for our, our, our audience. Absolutely. And if you just email the Halen house or send your email across, we can get those in a email format. That's really beautiful. And you can print them and have recipes to try at home. Absolutely. Great. And Thank just you. to add kind of one thing on top of there that I think is really overlooked. And when we're talking about that one thing to kind of do or start to implement, um, what really came to mind and is hydration. I think so many of us walk around and we live in this kind of chronic dehydrated state and we don't even realize it. Um, but a lot of your kind of low level symptoms or chronic symptoms that people experience, such as like pain or challenges with sleep or bowel movements, digestive issues, um, really can happen be, by being dehydrated. And so, yeah, we have on here, one of the tips is to just drink half your body weight in ounces of water daily. And to make that fun, you can always add in fresh lemon, you can add in some fresh herbs like mint. Um, I love throwing cucumber, even citrus, like orange in there or lime, um, even frozen blueberries. If you're one of those people who just hates water and you need to start kind of training yourself. Uh, one of the interesting things in, in my practice, and I have a lot of clients who we start with that, we start with hydration and you know, after a week of just getting the hydration levels up, they're already noticing some of their pains gone away. Um, some of their anxiety is starting to lessen. They're noticing they have less cravings. Oftentimes cravings for food um, can really be kind of a, a missed signal from the body that we're actually craving hydration. We're actually mm -hmm. thirsty. Um, and as we age that uh, signal of thirst starts to diminish as well. So if you're like, I'm, I'm really not thirsty. I think I get enough water in. Um, trust me, after you start to get the proper levels of hydration in, you'll notice that thirst kind of comes back and then you start to almost crave water in a sense. And, um, and I think Ann and Sandy could probably speak to this, but one of the um, first places that the body will pull it's water just, from when you're dehydrated is the brain. Brain. I was just going to say that, Deanne, you're right on. Absolutely. And you guys can speak more about that, but we just have so many processes that happen in the body that require hydration and that require that kind of um, electrical connection in the brain that require hydration. So just a really overlooked, really simple thing you can start today. Yeah. We have to have adequate water to get, to help get the nutrients into the cells and to help get the toxins out of the cells. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we're talking about not only the nutrition in, but detoxifying the body, that hydration is so important. And, you know, we listed the half your body weight um, in ounces of water as just basic, the minimum. And um, so if you're really looking at trying to detoxify the body, then gosh, we need to up that even more. And as we get into winter and we get even drier here in Central Oregon, you know, it's just so, so easily to be dehydrated. And I agree with you, when you're dehydrated, we start craving foods when really the body wants water. And if we want to ask our body to change, know that water is off where a lot of chemical reactions occur. So if you're dehydrated, these reactions aren't able to happen. Love it. So let's, let's relate that to, um, you know, we added here too. one really simple trick again is, um, before you have your coffee in the morning, and we're not going to take your coffee away immediately. Sometimes it might be necessary to alter that habit a little bit, but one simple thing you can do is just change your morning routine. Most people get up, they've either preset to the coffee pot to auto brew so that when they get up in the morning, all they have to do is stumble and put their mug right underneath the thing and their eyes aren't even open and they're drinking coffee. Some of you are fortunate enough to have maybe a, a spouse or a partner who brings it to you in bed. You know, how lucky are you? But I want you to change that habit. And I want you to think about as we go into this cold and flu season, um, which is coming, and which is also just a time for us, we're entering this season of different vegetables. We don't have as many, uh, say, local vegetables that are full of color that bring lots of different nutrition. So it's really important 
to begin with a little nutrition that's very hydrating. And, that, and that's really simple. Just make a cup of warm water uh, with a lemon slice and sit down and sip that before you have anything else. Before you, maybe before you brush your teeth, it's okay to get up and just let this be your first habit. Spend a few moments with yourself. And I'm gonna encourage everybody too, this is something I'm really working on for myself because we all fall into these habits is these are traumatic times. And what do we do when we're worried about something? We constantly check it, right? So let's not have grabbing the phone or grabbing the tablet be our first choice in the morning. Let's have it get up, be a breath, and then some warm water with lemon to try to build that nutrition or that hydration, excuse me. The other thing you're doing um, with the lemon is you're stimulating your digestive capacity a little bit so that when you are ready to eat, your, your uh, system is already gonna recognize just a little bit of nutrition in the lemon slice. It's already gonna have signaled your brain to start telling your digestive system to get ready. Uh, it's going to be time to eat soon. And you want to really greet that first meal of the day with as much digestive capacity as possible. And this really simple trick can help you do that. Okay, I want to ask, I think it was Anne that might have brought this into our previous discussion um, amongst the four of us. I have been known and called a fat freak. I use a lot of dietary fat in my diet. Um, and one of the questions we all get as nutritionists, well, wait a minute, I thought that was bad for me. I thought it was bad for my heart. I thought it was bad for, you know, my overall health, my cholesterol. But well, what bad is for bad for you is <laughs> bad fats. Hey, <laughs> so yeah, it's so I good ask fats you. that are good for you. So um, bad fats are toxins to our body, things like canola oil. Um, things in a clear plastic bottle are often rancid oils. Um, so I think that's something we should include, maybe a list of good fats in the handouts. Um, the idea is to get several, like four different good fats in, in a day, about two tablespoons of each. This could be avocados, it could be Olive oil is a great one um, on your salad. Olive oil is more low temp cooking. So higher, if you use olive oil at high temp, um, you know, you can destroy the, the um, nutrients. So knowing your oils is very important. Um, knowing what oils to use for which temperatures. Um, so I, we have a client you know, many clients who have lost all sorts of weight by introducing good fats to the body. So when the body is nourished and is getting what it needs, it, it can let go of the, the toxic things that it's holding on to, including adipose. Um, so joint issues, mental health issues, the brain is 60% fat. Every cell wall in our body, in every tissue and every organ is made of made up of lipids or fats. So really nourishing your body with good fats is a really important place to start. But we know that, um, we know that the gallbladder can be effective, effective negatively if you're not able to tolerate the fats. So if you start, if you get nausea or queasiness or anything when you start introducing good fats to your diet, back off start low and slow, and just know that introducing these good fats in your diet is really an important health issue, so. So the fats to avoid when you talked about bad fats. <clears throat> Some people <clears throat> probably may not know what that is. <clears throat> so hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats. So, you know, if you're buying things like peanut butter, you know, look for the peanut butter that doesn't have those hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. You can get single ingredient peanut butter for your kids. Simple things like that to start avoiding those bad fats. And as Anne said, bring in all these good fats into the diet. What are the fats in your kitchen, Deanna? You know, I was just thinking about that and I'm a huge avocado fan. So yeah. I love avocados. I love grass fed butter. I think that's just, I mean, butter just makes things taste good. And as a child, I grew up with the, uh, the concept that butter is not good for you, that you should eat the other types of alternatives, margarines. 
Um, I definitely had a lot of health issues as a child. Um, but when I learned, oh my gosh, butter has all these minerals and these nutrients. And if it is from a good, healthy grass-fed cow, I know most of us can get a good grass-fed butter at this point, even at Trader Joe's or Costco or anywhere down the street. Um, but yeah, butter is, is one of my go-tos. Um, avocados, I love olive oil in my dressings. I've really replaced a lot of my um, dressings that come from a bottle, which actually can be expensive at the grocery store and make Making your own dressings can be super simple and easy. Maybe I'll throw a couple of those little dressing recipes in there on that document just because, you know, making a dressing for the week and having it in the fridge can be so simple and easy and a great way to get in some healthy fats. Um, and then I'm a big fan of wild fish too. So I love sardines. I love, um, you know, those oilier fishes. I love salmon. And I try to cook mine a little bit lower and slower as well just to protect those oils in there. But um, yeah. When you said butter, it made me um, link us back to the effect of a food on our mental and emotional health. So one of the compounds um, commonly found in butter is a very specific fatty acid called butyric acid. Butyric acid is a component of one of your primary neurotransmitters, GABA. Um, I, gamma, alpha butyric acid, I can't remember how the whole uh, word of it, but GABA is what's known as the neurotransmitter that sort of prevents us from having a panic response. So I grew up with three older brothers and it was really common to walk into a room and one of my brothers would jump out from behind the door and try to scare me. Um, if I didn't have appropriate GABA production, that panic that I felt in that moment of being scared behind the door um, could continue and amplify and, and not be stopped. And what GABA as a neurotransmitter does is brings the anxiety level down. So butter in the diet is a great way to give your body one of the primary ingredients to making your own GABA. And it's always better to make your own than to try to catch up with supplementation to it later. So we can use that primary neurotransmitter in neuronutrition safely with the help of somebody like Deanna, but really what's wrong with just putting some butter on your broccoli? I think that's a better way to get to it. They have good fats and oils. They break down and help decrease inflammation. So, yeah. you know, another, you know, helping with pain. And, yeah. And yeah. Deanne, when you mentioned butter, my response, like you, you know, I thought about butyric acid and the importance of butter and ghee to the colon for colon health. Mm -hmm. um, as we see a higher and higher incidence of colon cancers and other colon issues, that that is one of the nutrients that's really important for colon health. So, yeah, absolutely. My mother is a 30 year colon cancer survivor, uh, but it wasn't without some trauma to her body and to herself. And um, it really led me to investigate the importance of feeding the colon healthfully. And as um, Sandy just said, butyric acid is what we would call a food for the colon. And so you can take it in supplemental form, of course, but it's so much better to get it in a, a compound like butter or ghee, which is a, um, it's just the milk fat from butter, right? And it has the proteins taken away from it. So some of you who feel like you might have a sensitivity to dairy, you may still tolerate uh, ghee. And especially if it's a cultured ghee, it's really easy to make your own ghee, but it's also really convenient to find in um, most grocery stores these days too. And I was just thinking about what's, you know, my kitchen's kind of open to my view here. And what I have out is I have butter, I have cultured ghee, I have coconut oil, I have beef tallow, I have pork lard, I have olive oil, yeah. Um, I have avocado oil, but my rule in my home is that I don't cook with pourable oils. They can be a, a little more um, the, prone to oxidation when you eat with them. So I can't say I never cook with olive oil, um, but when I do, I try to limit it. I try to limit the heat and I try to limit, um, sometimes I'll add one of those solid fat oils to it at the same time to keep the oil from oxidizing. There's a lot of evidence in scientific research that the issues around cholesterol aren't about cholesterol, it's about oxidized cholesterol. And so we wanna to try to minimize the oxidized foods we put into our body. It gets us back to choosing foods that are whole, fresh. You'll see over on the left side of our little quick cheat list here, You know, we have um, 
choosing foods that are, um, I, now I've lost it, uh, local, here we go, whenever possible, uh, seasonal, local, organic. And let's just throw out a couple of tips right here around food storage, food preservation. So realistically, this is October. We really shouldn't be expecting to eat strawberries in the Pacific Northwest in October. However, if you had some harvested from a great um, supply in May or June and they're in your freezer, totally great way to get them into your diet right now. But when we say seasonal, we want to think about really matching our diet to the season, sort of historically and ancestrally around the world. This is what cultures did. Um, they weren't expecting blueberries in January and they weren't expecting asparagus in November. Now we have a much greater variety available to us, but trying to think more seasonally is going to give your body um, the foods, the nutrition that it sort of needs for the time of year. One um, way we can um, boost our variety is sort of thinking about how we preserve foods. So one of the best way to preserve foods um, that cultures have done for centuries is to culture foods. Cultured and fermented foods are very important to brain gut health and they're very important as foods for the colon and for the microbes that live symbiotically within our intestinal tract. And so it's a great way to take the beets that you grew this summer and uh, ferment them. There's lots of easy recipes online, but there's also lots of commercially available high quality products where you can get fermented sauerkrauts and kimchi and uh, beet varieties and, and all sorts of things. We have lots of other cultured foods we could add in. That would be, you know, cultured dairy, um, cultured nut um, yogurts and things like that if you have a dairy sensitivity. I think so we have culturing, we have fresh foods and um, if now is the time of, year, um, time of season, maybe we have some foods that store a little bit, um, bit longer for us, things like squashes and um, pumpkins and, um, you know, some of the late season kales and, and late season spinach and lettuces and things like that. Um, so freezing is always going to be pre preferred over things that are otherwise processed. And by that, I mean, they might have those bad fats that Sandy was talking about added to it. They might be loaded with salt and canned in a commercial canning process that really sort of devoids all the nutrition out of that food. So if you're doing your home canning, great. Um, trying to limit um, canned foods like that and looking for things that are stored more in glass jars with fewer preservatives. I just did a, um, a blog article about a week ago about all the types of preservatives in um, our food supply and what it does to our gut and therefore what it does to our brain health. So as much as we can stay in that realm of fresh, frozen or properly preserved, whether it's fermented, whether it's canned appropriately in glass jars and not in um, metal tins. And certainly, um, I'll just quote one of my um, longest ago clients, a woman named Patty looked at me one day. She was quite addicted to her processed foods, things like you know breads and pastas and box cereal and things like that. And I was trying to get a point across to her about how important whole foods were. And she just said, she. She looked at me and she said, do you mean to tell me if it didn't grow out of the ground, fall off a tree, walk the earth or swim in the sea, don't eat it? And I said, exactly, that's it. It is that simple. So um, we want to, every time we make that choice, we wanna see, can we answer that question? Do I knew, know how this grew or how the ingredients within it grew? Because let's face it, we are gonna have a few labels in our life, all of us here, have some things on our pantry shelves that have a label in it. That means it's been processed in some way. But the closer we can get to the origin of the food is going to be the most helpful for us. And then another simple trick um, that really feels like, um, you know, maybe first grade mentality, but it's important for all of us is trying to get five different colors of food on your plate every day. And in the modern American lifestyle, a lot of our food is white, beige, bland, colored. It's, it's lacking color. It's in the color that we get the, the, a lot of the plant-based nutrition, a lot of the extra um, phytochemicals, um, things that are very supportive of your immune system, 
of your neurotransmitter production. We're getting vitamins and minerals. So as many colors as you can get into your day. And it's a great challenge for families. When you teach this to your kids, the kids are going to be like, mm -mm, we didn't get any red food today. We got to find it. It's, you know, six o'clock and dinner's coming. What's red? What can we get? So they learn to grab a radish or they learn, you know, to grab a beet or something else like that. Um, you know really? what? I was going to say, Kathy, oh my gosh, this is such great information. Um, but believe it or not, it's almost one o'clock. Hard to believe. Okay. Yeah, I well, know. I mean, you guys have shared so much. Um, and I know there's so much more to share. So having said that, is there a way for maybe each one of you to really, you know, give your, you know, last bits of, you know, what you really feel are important for people to, I'm all about, what can I add to my diet? You know, don't tell me I can't have this and I can't have that. Tell me what I can add. Something that, you know, how do you guys like walnuts? They say it looks like a brain. I mean, are walnuts good? I mean, They're something that I can add um, to my diet every day or, or just some, you know, each one of you go and say what you feel is really important to, um, you know, to add in, into your life, whether it's food-based or something else, so. Well, I just know that one thing that really I think is important is buying unsalted. And then when you bring your product home, to add good salt. Mm -hmm. um, good salt is Himalayan or Celtic sea salt, um, not the blue um, Morton's uh, that's processed. So getting a good salt, buying unsalted, and when you bring it home, so unsalted butter, unsalted grass fed, and you open it up and you add your salt, um, adds a lot of minerals to the diet. Oh, good suggestion. Yeah. Love that. And just, you know, I love how Kathy already mentioned eat the rainbow because that's really always my tip for people is like eat the rainbow. And I don't mean Skittles. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you clarified that, Deanna. <laughs> as many colors as you can. Um, but one of the things that I always like to just add on is when you're creating your plate or your meal is kind of looking at your plate and having kind of one healthy fat on there, one quality protein on there. And sometimes the healthy fat you won't see, right? It might not be avocado or fish. It might be olive oil or something else. Um, a healthy, a quality protein. So really trying to source an animal that's healthy if you are eating animal-based. Um, otherwise, getting another healthy uh, protein that's unprocessed. And then uh, a really complex carb. So getting that carbohydrate from a plant. So whether that's a sweet potato or a um, squash, which we have tons of squash varietals right now. So just looking at your plate and kind of saying, okay, do I have those three components, we call them macronutrients, but do I have a healthy fat, quality protein, and then a good carbohydrate on there. So, and, and another, just to add on to that is um, if you get to that point and you're like, oh, great, I'm doing this, then also saying, okay, is half my plate about, um, is, is it from plants? And I really think fiber is very, very overlooked, especially in digestive health. And we know our digestive health is kind of the foundation of all the rest of our health, um, as we've talked about today. So getting in a lot of fiber through plants can be super beneficial, especially we didn't get a touch on bowel movements, but if you're having any irregularity or you're having a hard time having a bowel movement every day or loose stools, um, adding in fiber from plants can just be really, really helpful, so. Mm -hmm. I know we're really short on time, so I'm gonna make this really quick. Um, since you guys touched on a lot of the stuff I was gonna say, but particularly if you're talking about your kids and having a hard time maybe getting them to eat greens, you know, they would, won't eat spinach or they won't eat lettuce. Then one of the things that I like adding are microgreens. They're, you know, when you look at your kids, like, oh, they're little tiny little things, you know, so it doesn't take much, but the nutrients in the microgreens, it's their sprouting and so they're, they're more dense in that small amount. So if you can add that for your kids, hide that in a, in a wrap up, or, you know, in a wrap with other things in it or finding ways to add those microgreens for kids, you can get a lot of nutrients packed into that um, and get that easily into a diet, hopefully easily into a diet for your kids or yourself. They're a little bit more expensive unless you learn to grow them yourself, but when you're buying them, they're a little more expensive, but they're really packed with, um, with wonderful nutrients. So, and again, as we talked about before, hydration, hydration, hydration. So really focusing on that as well. Anne, do you wanna chime in with your special things? What you would suggest? Oh, I talked about salt. 
Um, oh, and that's right. I'm sorry. That's right. Sea salt um, and adding that. Um, the beets are really great for the gallbladder. So any, so it helps thin bile. So that's someone with maybe constipation um, mm -hmm. uh, three times a week <laughs> yeah. can really help it, help with digestion. Um, Beets, radishes, artichoke, cabbage, broccoli. I mean, those are all great nutrients that also help with some gentle detoxification as well. So, and our nutrition, chlorella, seaweed, some of the things that aren't as, as normal in our diets as other cultures, but there's some other things we can add as well. And maybe we could add, I, I mean, you have so many great uh, tips on that, um, that uh, PDF that you've done that we can get out to people. Um, if there's anything else in the meantime um, that you guys wanna add to it, and then again, anyone can you know contact us at Hale and House. Um, Cheryl, it's, what, what's the email, email again? It's halenhouse at gmail.com. At gmail, that's right, halenhouse at gmail. And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna post these links on um, the meetups. Um, so it's Bend Wellness Community on Central Oregon Women's Wellness, um, the Facebook pages, um, the Healing Trauma Conference Facebook page. So these links will be on there. Um, yeah, so anything else before we wrap it up? Kathy, any, any more words of wisdom? I, I mean, add two things. Okay, absolutely. Everybody to add one cultured food to your diet this week. And I'm not talking Yo Play yogurt that has lots of sugar in it. Try a sauerkraut, a kimchi, some kind of fermented vegetable. Try something and just a little condiment portion of it. Just, and you might think you don't like it after the first bite. Let it sit there, take another bite. I always tell, especially working with children, I say, you know, take at least one no thank you bite. No, thank you. you could, you're welcome to say no thank you after you've taken one no thank you bite. And then the other thing I would leave us with is that because I really do believe that um, the brain gut connection is where it's at, and it's why I really applaud the work of Ann and Sandy and Deanna as well too, is that we really need to get back to being present with our food, present with ourselves, present with um, the act of eating. So if I could give you one tool to activate your vagus nerve, your vagus nerve is, starts with your brainstem in the back of your head and it wanders, it's called the wandering nerve and it travels into your stomach and it, it stimulates your digestive system. So before every meal, I want you to try this. Um, some of you are people of faith and you give thanks for your food. This is a perfect time to do this. Your plate is in front of you. You see it, you're witnessing the rainbow of colors on it. You see your little healthy fats and your added salt and your fermented vegetables and a little bit of water. Look at it, appreciate it, be grateful for it. And then I want you to take three slow inhales, but when you exhale, exhale slower. And you're gonna exhale through pursed lips. So it's gonna look like this. You can do it with me. Take an inhale through your nose. Exhale slower through your pursed lips. Two more times. One more. What you just did was put your autonomic nervous system tilted into what's known as the parasympathetic state You've turned on your digestive capacity. You've turned on the capacity for your neurotransmitters to talk to your brain appropriately to tell you you're ready to eat, you're safe, you're held, you're secure, and everything you put in your mouth from there on is gonna go better for you if you take that step before every meal. Wow. Thanks, Kathy. You beat me to it because that was the one thing I was gonna close with and add was that we are so bombarded with stressful messages these days. Mm -hmm. And all of that stress keeps us in the sympathetic mode or the fight or flight. And when we're in that sympathetic mode, we just don't digest well. And so the, what you taught us is perfect. Um, 
because that's what I was going to say is gratitude, gratitude for our food, gratitude for the things that we do have, even if we are struggling maybe with finances because of job loss with COVID or whatever it is, find something to be grateful for. Um, we live in a beautiful community, so get out in nature. You know, just really be in nature, grounding, whatever it is to find our way out of the stress and the toxins that that creates within us. So thanks for giving us that exercise. That's yeah, great. I was going to say, I mean, I could totally just feel it within my body. So just that little simple thing, just what a difference. I mean, I immediately just felt just more calm, Good. you know, so. Good. The gosh. little trick with the pursed lips has to do with this is a sphincter muscle around your mouth. And there are sphincter muscles all along the digestive tract, including like where the bile comes out of the liver and into the gallbladder and into the small intestine. And there's little sphincter muscles along your intestines that allow food and waste to move along. When you activate one, you strengthen and tone all of them. So you're basically exercising muscles of your nervous system uh, and of your digestive system when you do that. Wow. Well, obviously we could go another hour easy, easily. You guys are so full of information. I, you know, I cannot thank you enough. So what we'd love for you to also do, if any of you, because I know um, Ann and Sandy, you do a lot of different talks. Um, so we would be happy to post in, you know, any of your talks on our Bend Wellness Community website, because this is information, I mean, that's one of our six areas, you know, nutrition is one of those six areas that uh, we'd like to try to cover, you know, mental, emotional, spiritual, um, physical, social, and nutritional. And you guys, so I think I got them all. But um, anyway, so we would, we want this to be an ongoing educational series, you know, for our for our listeners, you know, for our audience. So please, you know, let us know um, if, if you, whenever you're doing a talk, because we would love to support you in that, because you guys have given us such great information. Maria, Cheryl, anything that you want to add or as we close it out? Oh, I'd just like to say thank you to all of these wonderful women. I um, <laughs> made lots of notes lots of good information. Um, I want to share it with uh, folks that I work with um, to help them as well. Um, so thank you so much for participating with us today. It's been great. Yeah, yeah and I concur. Lots, lots of wonderful information. Some stuff I know, a lot, I, and others I didn't are in good reminders. So, but yes, uh, very grateful for all of you and what you do and, and starting us off on this, this, um, these educational talks. So thank you very much. Thank you for being the first of, thanks for, you know, series thanks to you guys. So everybody look else. for those links with all this great information. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great day. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you guys Bye. at Halen House. We appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Well. Thank you.